Hello, I'm Shannon Pace Brinker. I wanna welcome you to our course today, Repair Not Replace. Some of you may be wondering why is a dental assistant giving a course like this? I will tell you that I'm very, very passionate about the fact that any time we can repair uh, a fracture, a chip, or a place where a patient may have broken porcelain without having to have the restoration replaced, I think that's a great service that we can offer. And so today what I wanna do is just kind of walk you through some of the tried and true steps that we have done in our practice and most importantly, the success that we've had. And I wanna just kind of reflect on some of the avenues of products, most importantly, the procedure steps and share with you some of the great outcomes and some of the things that we haven't done successfully. And I think that's really important. Before we begin, I always want to to thank all of the, um, the doctors and my mentors in my life that have really helped me um, to get where I am today. And most importantly, given me really the knowledge because none of us really say we've gained this knowledge on our own. It doesn't happen, right? We always wanna give credit where credit is due. I first wanna start off um, as a dental assistant when I first started working, I was in Charlotte. I worked for Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I worked for a very famous dentist there. His name is Dr. Ross Nash. Some of you may know him. I worked with Dr. Nash for almost 13 years. Um, and uh, I will tell you, I knew nothing about uh, cosmetic dentistry, nothing about bonding until I came to work for him. Um, but I know that the restorations that he did were absolutely beautiful. And I remember it just like it was yesterday, uh, being interviewed and watching him deliver restorations um, was just amazing to me. I learned so much because a lot of our patients would come in really for just veneers or full mouth, full mouth reconstruction. And uh, not really for one Tuesday dentistry or even quadrant dentistry. And um, we had a lot of beautiful cases, but there were times when we would have patients come back with chipped incisal edges and fractures. And really, sometimes we just didn't know where, where or how, or it was never really talked about as far as how that happened. We just assumed that maybe the patient had an accident or maybe there was something wrong with the porcelain or maybe it was you know the lab's fault, right? We always wanna blame it on the lab. You know, that's kind of our fallback, you know, but I will say I learned a lot from him. After 13 years, I moved to uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I got just the absolute best job in the world working with Dr. John Cranham um, and Pete Dawson, who we say in the States is almost the, known as the godfather of occlusion. I knew nothing about occlusion when I worked in Charlotte. I learned nothing there when it came to that. You know, I mean, we just made teeth look pretty, but I didn't again know a lot about occlusion until I really went to work with Dr. Cranham. Um, and I took about 3,000 hours of continuing education on occlusion. It really opened my eyes as to why are these teeth, you know, chipping and breaking and fracturing. So I really look back at, you know, working with Dr. Nash at the time, he was an evaluator for reality publishing, which is why Michael Miller is up here. I became an evaluator with Dr. Miller, because I did a lot of Dr. Nash's evaluations. And he asked me one time at dinner, he said, I think you're probably the one doing his evaluations because you talk about things that a dentist usually doesn't talk about. And of course I, I couldn't lie. And I said, I do. Don't tell him that I told you, he might fire me. Um, and he said, no, I want you to come on board and be one of my editors. Um, and, um, and I was for a very long time and I learned, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about what Dr. Miller taught me. The other doctor that is pictured today is Ed McLaren, and I have such a respect for him. Um, I got to assist him when we both were working with a, um, a project with E4D, which is now Plan Mecca, and uh, just learned so much. I had no idea who he was, but, and, but the magnitude of the things that he said and taught me um, really stayed with me. And I still use a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today in this course I learned from him. And so I felt like being a lab technician and a dentist, he has a totally different perspective, but I will tell you it was a real perspective because I already was doing some of those techniques in my practice. He just kind of what we call sealed the deal, right? So you may ask Shannon, why are you teaching this course? What, what brought you to doing this? In, in the States, I teach so many classes and, um, and, and I will say that probably the number one um, component of all those courses is restorative. Why is that? Because I'm a patient. 
very, very long, long time ago, I was in a really bad car wreck, but I will tell you before my car wreck, my teeth were very short. They were chipped. They were worn. They were straight across. It almost looked like denture teeth. People would say at a very young age, I'm a bruxer. I'm a clincher. I break teeth. And when I came to work for Dr. Nash, I had direct bonding done first and it lasted me probably about four months and I broke number six. Then a few months later, I broke number eight. And at the time I was like, well, this composite is no good. We probably need to think about porcelain It's stronger and that's probably what I need. And then I had very simple veneer, so simple to where I didn't even have to have any temporaries made or provisionals made. And one couple months later, I broke number seven. Then I broke number 12. Um, I already had crowns on my back teeth and I just continuously broke teeth just over and over and over. When I moved to Virginia, I was completely restored by Dr. Cranham, but I was restored with a product called Emax. And a lot of you have heard Emax, but I was the first Emax recipient um, all pretty much fell spathic. Very, very few of my teeth were actually zirconia, but they were layered in fills pathic porcelain. And most of you know that that did not last, right? They've totally redone uh, that porcelain. Well, I was the first person. I was so proud of it. I broke just about every tooth. So last year, if we include last year, I would have had my sixth reconstruction. These are my teeth. And I can tell you that as time goes on, any time porcelain is removed, I don't care if you're wearing 12 power magnification, you're going to remove tooth structure, no matter who they are, what's going on. And every time we're losing that tooth structure, we tell patients, oh, it's going to last you know, 10 years. It could, I've heard people even say the rest of your life. That's not true because we really don't know sometimes what those patients are going to do to that porcelain. And I'm that patient. So I can tell with you firsthand what I know, what I've learned, and most importantly, what works and really having you to look at things a little bit different, hopefully after this course today. Here's exactly what I do to restorations. I wear them down. I break teeth. We have to really understand before things can be repaired or even replace, let's talk about replacement. We got to know why did that happen? How did it chip? Did they break the whole tooth? Was it something that happened right away? Was it something that you feel in your heart and mind knowing what you know? Did it happen because of the porcelain? Was it something that happened in the lab? Was it something that they did themselves or was it because the restorations and the teeth were not in the proper position? Because you can't just arbitrarily see a tooth that fractures and then replace it, cut the restoration off and replace it. And then it happened again. You can't just say, well, it must be the lab or it must be the bonding agent. It must be the cement. We have to really think about that. And I can tell you firsthand in my earlier years as a dental assistant, these were the things that we did. We just replaced the restoration or we replaced it with something stronger. And I can tell you, I know for a fact that it chipped again or it broke again or it probably didn't last because there are times you know we see patients for cosmetics and we don't really see them again and i can tell you that i know that's probably me how do how do i know that let me share with you the last set of preps it's amazing if you remember where my teeth were in that second preparation stage versus here i hardly have any tooth structure i can tell you that i could not even imagine um, how many times and how much tooth structure was, was lost. If I would have known now what I know back then, I would have never, ever moved on from composite to porcelain until I knew that the bite was right. Ideally, Pete Dawson told me, Shannon, if your teeth were in the proper position with orthodontics first, you probably wouldn't have lost so many teeth. I have inlays, onlays, crowns, bridges, veneers, implants, sinus lifts, tissue surgery, there's nothing in dentistry I haven't had. And so this is why I think it's so important. When I give courses like this, I have a lot of dentists and listen, I'm a dental assistant. I'm not a dentist. I wish I was, but I will tell you that I've seen enough dentistry chip fracture to know that, you know, there's a lot of things that we know, but there's a lot of things sometimes we don't know. And what's the easiest to repair is composite until you do know. The other thing is, is that a lot of my friends who were dentists, 
believe that what I'm talking about will never last. It doesn't work. There's no reason for it. But then I see other speakers and dentists talking about re-veneering the restorations, like re-veneering a bridge, re-veneering a crown, prepping it down to the core and then putting a veneer on the top of it. But I got to tell you that, you know, I understand why they're doing it. But if you look at those margins and you look at a prep like this, yes, it looks good. But I can tell you that I could not imagine maybe did that veneer fit that margin the way it really should. And is that are we really doing a really good service for the patient? To me, what is it? Is it apples and oranges compared to repairing something um, or just re-veneering it? I, I don't know. You know, so I feel like if you're going to re-veneer re -veneer something, cut it off and just redo it, you know. But again, I'm not here to talk about other doctors and their dentistry. I just know what I know. And I just want you to kind of have the other options. You know, what else can we do? What I know is when my teeth were prepared, we know that when you got a PFM, you can cut a slice in it. You can take an instrument and just pry it open and it'll pop off so much easier than zirconia. And I can tell you that when my dentist, Dr. Corman, cut off my zirconia restorations, we went through 23 burrs because we know that that burr has got to go through that restoration and it's got to be cut in you know side of the cross it's got to be cut in thirds and you know it, it's just amazing how many pieces are going to chip off but it's never going to come off like a pfm would and so this is why i feel it again is a good service why do i think that because there's so many studies that talk about you know how many burrs you're going to go through and um and how hard it is to cut through zirconia um, this is my prep. You can see how thick the restoration was. You can imagine it took us for 10 restorations. I say us, <laughs> I didn't prep my teeth, but I held a mirror and watched 12 hours to cut all of these off. 10 restorations. So he hated me <laughs> that night and I hated him because I was already waking up. But I will say that those are the things you want to think about, you know, is when these things happen. But the other thing is I want us to be focused and don't forget about the bite because the bite is everything. If we're restoring teeth and we know that, um, or we don't know enough about occlusion, nothing's going to last, it's going to break. And for me, I parafunction, which means I fiddle with my teeth all day and all night. So those are the cases where if you don't know enough about occlusion, you know, taking courses from Dr. Cranham from the Dawson Academy or taking courses at Spear, these things are so important, or Leanne Brady at Panky, you always need to learn a little bit more when you think about porcelain. The beauty of composite, again, we can repair it, right? It's so much easier. And we want to look at age. I cry sometimes when I see patients that I look back on that came into my practice wanting veneers because they were going to be Miss Teen USA or Miss America. And they were only like 22, 23 years old. I feel so bad knowing what I know now and knowing we couldn't go back because if that were my daughter at this age, I would have never, ever, ever thought about that, you know, and those are the things that you, you can't take back, you know, you can only go forward. So again, this is my passion. This is why I think it's so important. This is the reason why I feel like we need videos like this to show patients what's happening, but you have to understand whatever you're going to put there and whatever you're going to replace, we want to make sure that we understand, um, you know, how to make sure that it, you know, it is shape correctly it's going to last as as long as we possibly can uh, but most importantly these videos are really important i think to have patients understand how it happened and um, making sure that they understand the things that we need to help them with the post-operative instructions it's something in the us i don't know if in, in australia you're a little bit different but here we spend so little time on post-operative instructions that when we are delivering restorations, we don't tell patients just that, you know, you can't bite into a bagel and you got to be really careful about the things that you're biting into or using your teeth for, you know. And so this is why, again, little videos, having the conversation with patients will help us to help them to understand. Now, we're going to talk more about that as we get into it. I think I've talked enough about what are we looking for? How do we have an understanding? But most importantly, when we think about the bonding process and the things that we were told and the, the adhesion and bonding issues that we have with various products and materials, everyone has their own idea of 
what materials we should be utilizing. Is it a self etching material? Is it a two step? Is it a universal? I'm not here today to really, you know, take you in into a totally different direction of what you believe and what you're utilizing. I still, and I'm 50, I like to fall back on the tried and true because I can tell you that when we know things are tried and true and they've been utilized for a long period of time and we've got history with it, your failure rate is really going to be minimized. And I'm kind of old school in that way. Um, and so I like to kind of, and in industry, you already know, you're creatures of habit anyway. You never want to rely on a salesperson coming in to tell you it's the latest and greatest and jump on that latest and greatest, right? Um, and, and that's one of the things I want you to be, you know, clear about. But most importantly, you have to think about this restoration that is chipped and broken. We have to go through the steps to find out why did it break? And this is where, you know, as dentists, you need to train your assistants, your dental nurses to make sure that they are writing their charts up specifically, not only to talk about the restorative, you know, as far as what materials were utilized, you know, as far as the bonding process, you know, what etch was used, what was the brand, what was the name? Because I can tell you in dentistry, we don't remember what the brand of this is. We just know that it's blue and it's creamy and it's etch, right? This is where we really want to make sure that you are charting correctly. Um, and again, being a product evaluator, I had to write down the product, the manufacturer, because so many people don't know the manufacturer um, and making sure that as you're noting everything and you're charting your materials, you can look back and see did that fail? Oh man, that product must have been bad or maybe that wasn't the right thing to utilize or maybe it wasn't the right step. This is where you really and truly, and listen, when I have a patient, I almost write a Bible, that's what my, my uh, assistants say when I'm teaching them because I don't want to miss a step, but I don't want to make a mistake because I want to make sure that whatever product I was utilizing, I wrote it down in case something was wrong with the product, right? So first thing that I want to mention is you, when you think about tried and true, let's make sure that you are going through the best, best reasoning, the, the most important steps, a checklist for your team, a checklist for yourself, because sometimes in dentistry, you know, we'll get to moving and we've got our mind on another patient waiting, or we've got hygiene checks to do. And I'm not a dentist, but I know what you're feeling and what you're going through is, you know, our minds are one of the things. So we want to make sure that we never change the steps. You know, it's kind of like when we're delivering veneers, we always deliver number eight, then we do nine, then we do seven, then we do 10, then we do six, and then we do 11. We never change that order at delivery. And we haven't for many, many, many years because that's our mindset. And that's the mindset that I want you to have when you think about repairing porcelain, because you have to follow steps. But let me just tell you, sometimes we'll just choose one of these steps and then skip over some things. The way to make sure that you get the very, very best bond strength is to roughen up the surface. The mechanical bond is really where we have failures. When we don't get and look at exactly what we need to do, and it's not just a pick one, why not just back yourself up and do everything that you can to make sure you get the best bond? And how does that happen? The first thing is if a patient chips a front tooth, and when I say that, um, you know, most of my patients are doing full mouth reconstruction. It could be, you know, a four unit bridge. It could be a three unit bridge. It could be a six unit bridge is what we're going to be looking at today. When I'm looking at things like that, there is no way that I can tell the patient that we're going to have to replace this. If, you know, we always want to do that, but we don't want to just arbitrarily put them in a financial burden. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I like to give them options, but I want to make sure that when I give them those options that I give them a little bit of a lifespan. You know, you can't guarantee that it's going to last, you know, five years, but if they can buy six months to a year, two years, three years, the cases I'm going to show you today, five years, six years, I had one patient never came back. Most of looked really good because you never came back. Right? So thinking about that bond technique, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that that surface is abraded. And when I say that, a couple of ways. The first thing is, is we want to take a burr to it. We want to make sure that it's rough, really rough and porous looking, right? Taking them, no matter if you look at it and it's not shiny, still take a diamond and just ever so slightly roughen it up. Not a carbide, a diamond. Then what we want to do is we want to take a micro etcher. If you don't have one of these micro etchers, 
oh my gosh, you'll get your monies back out of it within 30 days. This one is one from Ultradent. Danville Engineering has one. This sprays out aluminum oxide and you can use this for so many things. Every time I make a provisional, I don't care what it is, a veneer, a crown, inlay, an onlay, a bridge. I always micro braid it on the inside to give me a better cementation for that provisional. And it's the same theory with everything that we do, no matter what restoration we're seeding, we micro etch it. So it's a great, great item to have and a piece of equipment to have um, to utilize that. So we're gonna braid it with a diamond. We're going to micro etch it. And that's just not me. Also Ed McLaren, so many scientists talk about that abrasion, um, doing both and using hydrofluoric acid. If you do all three of those, you're going to have the most amazing bond strengths right there. But if you just pick one, sometimes we find that that might be the reason why it debonded. So play it safe and, and do it right and go ahead and do all three. I mean, what do you got to lose, right? Then we're going to utilize silane. And a lot of doctors don't like silane. They feel like it is a contaminant. And again, I'm not a dentist, but I know that I have repaired hundreds <laughs> of porcelain restorations because we consider that in the United States a temporary restoration until the patient is ready to replace it. So legally I'm allowed to do that because I am certified here in the United States. Um, but I can tell you to really be honest, more than 75% of those patients have those two, three, four, five, six, seven years, which is, it's crazy, but I am not making it up. And I know it's because I'm following all three of these these situations here, all three of these materials, and I'm using silane. I've never had that. And utilizing a really good bonding agent. But again, you say, Shan, there's a lot of bonding agents out there. They're all good. There's a lot of really good ones, but are you following manufacturer's instructions? Because I can tell you that when we're teaching and we see, you know, we're using this bonding agent and I can watch, you know, clinicians just painting it on like a mop. Or, you know, it could be one where you're only supposed to apply really thin layer, um, or it could be one like this one today that when we utilize them where you got to scrub it. So you got to read directions and listen, we know in dentistry, we don't read. We think we know everything because we feel like this bonding agent is like this bonding agent, and this composite is like this composite, but they are very different. The other thing that I learned from Michael Miller is you never, ever mix manufacturers materials with other manufacturers and the reason being is because they're made to go together and i'm gonna say that again they're made to go together when you get failures it's because a lot of times we feel like each product is the same and we can mix match them it's the same when we're taking impressions i probably am the, one of the number one teachers in the u.s for impressioning and i can tell you it's because we're mixing different manufacturers you don't want to do that and so today what we're going to do is we're going to go through and talk about hydrofluoric acid saline we're going to go through using the bonding agent and then we're going to go through our composites and show you step by step how to do it why is the saline to me and using hydrofluoric acid so important and why do i like ultradent i will tell you that today i have no sponsor nobody's paying me any money i'm here to talk about what i know what i love which is which is great um and and really allows me freely to talk about the things that i like and the things that i don't like um, and I've been using ultra dense, you know, hydrofluoric acid, their porcelain etch. Oh my God, almost my whole career. And, uh, and I can tell you that why do I use silene? Because we had some restorations that kept popping off of a patient and we were like, what in the world? This never happens. You know, we're, I'm working for an occlusion doctor that teaches occlusion and this patient, we're like, she must be eating rocks or something. Right. So finally, after two patients and this was happening, I was like, oh my gosh. So these veneers came in. They happened to be my husband. Okay. This is my husband. And I noticed that on the inside, it was kind of splotchy looking and Shoji Shuruga, my lab technician here in the United States. Um, our office was hooked off of Bayview dental lab, which is the lab we use. And I walked over to Shoji and I said, Shoji, this looks kind of funny on the inside of these. And I said, did you etch these? And he said to me, Shoji, no etch. <laughs> and I said, well, Shannon, no etch. And as we started talking, we found that, you know, some of the reasons why we thought those veneers were coming off is because they weren't properly etched. And he thought I was etching them. I thought he was etching them. So I never, ever just assume the lab is doing that. And, and you don't either. So you can see here where it's really nice. It's frosty appearance. 
if you don't see this in anything that you do, no matter if it's phosphoric acid or um, hydrofluoric acid, then you got to go back and you got to etch it again. You don't just assume, well, it'll be okay. And you got to train your team to do that too. Backing up. This happens to be a 9% hydrofluoric acid. So this is what we really need in order to have a good mechanical bond. The products that I'm also gonna to utilize today are Vital Essence. And I love Vital Essence really because it's easily handling. It's so easy to maneuver. And you're gonna see here in a minute when I say that I don't like to use instruments. And you may say, Shannon, that's crazy. How do you not like to use instruments? Because I don't need them. Not every composite allows me to not use instruments. The other thing is, is that I like the fact that I'm able to extrude it out very easily. Now, let me back up just for a second. Just because science tells us and speakers tell us to use a microfill versus a hybrid, um, because one polish is better than the other, I can tell you that this is the time where you kind of have to look at how does it look, um, you know, and how are you layering it? And most importantly, what type of porcelain is it? Because the thing here is, you know, Phil's Pathic Porcelain is very easy to repair. When we get into zirconia, we have to look at a composite that most importantly isn't going to look too opaque, like a moon tooth. Um, and most importantly, we may have to use opacious colors. Now, let me talk to you about those opacious composites, because there are times that I've used opacious composite and it turned into a moon tooth and it kind of made a liar out of me because I was like, well, I need to lay opacious layer down before I start layering it in other colors. And I can tell you it looked worse than it would if I had just used one color. Now, the one thing about composite, but as long as you don't cure it, you can just take your spatula and just remove it. We're not perfect, okay? And I can tell you in the demonstrations that I did here, I had to take the composite off and go up a different shade because I thought by layering it, and sometimes we just don't know, we may have to start over. This is where you don't want your uh, team up front to only schedule you 15, 20 minutes, no matter how great and how fast you are, because you got to have the time to know that if it doesn't look good, you're going to remove that composite um, and start over. And that's okay, because in dentistry, we're not perfect. Everything we do in dentistry isn't perfect, because if you say that, you're lying, right? We're dealing with the human body, and we're human too. So that's important. The other thing is, is that Thinking about the shade guide is really important. Um, I love this shade guide, and I will tell you that there's a lot of great ways for us to really fall back on, you know, thinking about your team, going back to training them and making sure they understand. But there are times that this layering technique, for those of you that are artists, and, and I love, love layering technique, that might not be the option for a restorative restoration that we're talking about here. So again, thinking about that. And um, sometimes you put the artistic side of layering to the side and you really may only need one color. And I'm gonna share that with you. I have to think about Frank Milner. He is one of the most amazing polishing gurus in the world, Frank Milner. So I'm gonna say it again, Frank Milner, you gotta look him up. He's got all these YouTube videos. He is the polishing king. Today is not so much about the polishing. Today is about helping you to understand the bonding technique and how you can repair porcelain. But I do want you to know that this was a technique that I learned from Frank. What he said to me was, Shannon, if you're not really sure about the composite that you're using, um, what you can do is you can take a little piece of composite, ball it up into a little ball, okay? And here, what you'll do, you'll see me, I am taking the composite, and I'm going to, I'm not really sure, you know, right now I'm taking the material and I'm balling it up in a ball and I'm going to place it right on the facial surface um, of that tooth that we're going to be preparing or the tooth adjacent to it. And then I'm going to take another color just to make sure, because sometimes when we're looking at color and we know that, that um, it can kind of look the same, right? After three seconds, science says that we have to kind of look away and look again because they look the same. And Frank said, Shannon, if you take the composite and you ball it up and you put it on a little tiny ball and just put it on top, don't pat it, just ball it up, sit it on the facial surface and cure it. It'll really kind of give you an idea. Do you have the right shade? And I will tell you, since he told me that, um, I like to steal it because that's what I'm doing now and it works. Okay. So you'll see here, let me just back up um, and let's show you how we're doing that.
So you'll see here where, again, to the right is my A1, to the left is my A2. It's it's foolproof. Now, there's a camera that I also use. Um, it's from Shofu. It's called the iSpecial C2 camera. It has an isolate mode that actually takes out the color and it gives you just gray. Um, and it helps a little bit too. But sometimes, again, with the naked eye, no matter um, how you know great your vision is, this really is a great way just to make sure that you're on track. And so think about that. Let's look back at an article. This was an article that I wrote many, many, many years ago. And um, I will tell you that I used the same technique because this patient never came back, never saw her again um, until probably 11 years later, I saw her at a Mexican restaurant. Um, and I said, hey, I, I, I think I know you. You know, and it's funny, we don't remember names. I don't even remember her name, but I remember the teeth we did. Um, and, um, and she said, yeah, you repaired this front tooth for me. Look, it's still there. And I was like, I wish I had my camera, you know, because I said, please, you gotta come back in. And, uh, and I could kick myself, you know, because we have to make sure that, you know, when we're doing a great service, we want to see them so we can get them back and take our photos. And that's one of the things I learned um, by uh, trying to become a stalker, right? You can't get them back in uh, when you don't schedule it. So make sure you're doing that. But here's the chip that she had, porcelain veneers, absolutely beautiful, but she had them for a couple of years. So I was kind of scared because whoever tells you that porcelain doesn't change color, I beg to differ with the foods we eat, porcelain can stain too. Um, and so, you know, this is where you really have to go back to that shade, you know, try and error, right? So here, I know there's a lot of incisal translucency. You never want to just arbitrarily place incisal translucency on a tooth that doesn't have it. Even if we love it, if it doesn't have it in the tooth beside it, don't just give them that translucency again, because you don't want them to come back and say, when I stick my tongue up here, you can see through it. And I only know because I've done that. So the first thing that you want to do is, you know, you want to look at the area that's chipped and think about it. And the case that I'm showing you today is exactly pretty much the same case. So when we get back to that and we look at this patient, one of the other things that I want you to really think about is the case that we wrote up had a very, very thin fracture. If a patient has lost a couple of layers of porcelain, and a lot of times it's translucent and you can't really see it, but you can see that it's kind of shaved and sheared off. When you hear doctors talk about that white line, that white line, it's not, you know, the white line is there a lot of times because of the fracture line that you got. And I never want that to be across the front of the tooth. And that wasn't me. That's one of the things I have to say with Dr. Nash is he never, ever, you know, cut the tooth in half or especially a class four. He always beveled it because this way, when he layered it, you didn't see the line or the, I'd say the you know, just the outline of where the fracture was. And so this is where you still want to remember what I said, take a diamond, roughen it up. And I don't want to just repair just one little area because patient bites into something, it's going to pop off, right? You want to bevel it a little bit. So you know, you got not only the micro etcher, you've got your, or your diamond, roughen it up, your micro etcher, and now you're going to do your hydrofluoric acid. Okay. And I know I'm beating you to death here, but Got to know those steps. So here we've got the fracture and you can see it's kind of sheared off. Um, I took a little diamond and I just kind of roughen it up. Now in the States, I can't use a high speed hand piece. So I have to get my doctor over to kind of roughen it up for me. Um, sandpaper disc will not work. You don't want to use that. You want a real diamond just to roughen it up. Then what I'm going to do is again, I'm just going to pretend I had already micro etched it. Now I'm ready for my hydrofluoric acid. This is a 9% use a timer okay everything in dentistry is is too slow right the other thing is is i love this edge because it's jelly now i also love and i know that with ultra dent they tell you they've got they're the syringe people they've got different tips i use this tip for everything i don't even use any of the other tips um except for my peak um, bonding agent but i love this it's a little fuzzy brush why do i really like it the most is because the fibers don't break off into the composite and there's a lot of little mini brushes out there that the fibers will get into the composite and um and that i don't like um this one does not do that it's made but look how easy it is for me to handle it the other thing is before you put the tip on you always extrude it out train your assistant to do that putting it on but notice when i etched it i went right in the center first because i didn't want it to just go everywhere if it does get on the other teeth just wipe it off pretty quickly. Um, again, we're human. Has it happened? Yes. But there are some edges out there that are very hard and sticky. So when you go to you know, squeeze it out or extrude it out, it kind of goes and shoots out. 
that's what I love about this little micro brush. And, um, and I will tell you, it's one of my favorite products that they have. Here it says 90 seconds. Now this is where I'm kind of going to fib on the directions a little bit because this is not a natural tooth structure. This is all porcelain to porcelain, right? Now, if it was porcelain to natural tooth structure, um, I'm going to be really careful to make sure that I just outline the porcelain and then whatever tooth structure is showing, I'm going to go to my phosphoric acid. Okay. But we're repairing porcelain here. It's all porcelain. So um, it says 90 seconds. Now you can't over etch the porcelain. Okay. At least I haven't heard anyone say they have. So I like to go and bump it up just a little bit longer because again, sometimes, you know, even with the timer, we want to, it's kind of like the cure light, right? We want to make sure that we cured it again. Um, you can't hurt anything. And I want that frosty surface. If we don't see that frosty surface, we're not going to get a good bond and it's going to come off. And so this is where spend a little bit more time making sure it looks good. After you rinse it off, thoroughly rinse it. Okay. What we're going to do next is we're going to, jump to our um our next acid and you say shannon why are we using phosphoric acid you just use hydrofluoric now you're going to use phosphoric we are because there's studies out there that say that um, by utilizing the phosphoric acid it's going to remove any of the salt layer that was in the hydrofluoric acid and some people will use um you know peroxide or whatever but this has consepsis in it so what's great about it is it, it kind of cleans everything um, when we jump to that silane here in a little bit. So this is going to clean off the salt and then we're going to jump to our silane so we get a better bond. And most importantly, we're going to be able to clean um, the surface really nice because it has that chlorhexidine in it. So again, phosphoric etch, hydrofluoric etch, and then we're going to go to our, um, our silane. So thank you, got the picture here. We've got our... Um, our etch for our um, hydrofluoric, the phosphoric, and now we're gonna get into the, um, the silane. I'm gonna make sure I don't miss that step here for you. So now once we've placed the silane, I'm gonna let that evaporate, okay? It's gonna slowly evaporate and you'll see it in the light. You'll kind of see when you drop it, it'll just kind of run a little bit and then I wait. I really don't take an air water syringe to it too quickly. Um, and a lot of times I don't take an air water syringe to it at all. I'm just going to let it kind of dry. Okay. So here again, we've, we've utilized that porcelain edge. We're going to go through and, uh, and just make sure that we have, um, a, again, a really good, um, silenated surface. Now we're going to go to our peak bonding agent. Now this peak is a universal bonding agent. One of the, the great thing that I like it is this really gives you a choice if you are, you know, prepping a molar um, that, you know, you really want to use a two-step or a one-step, you know, a self-etching, it can do that. If you want to, um, you know, a total etch, you can use it for that. And that's what I love about these universal bonding agents is you still can do what it is that you feel is best, you know, in your hands or best for your patients. And so by utilizing PEAK, I feel like, you know, I have the best of both worlds. Um, but most importantly, I know what the bond strengths are. And I love the fact that you're scrubbing it in. Those are the directions. Um, and that's what I follow with Ultradent. And I tell you, I like it better than using a mop method or, you know, just, you know, just taking a little brush and just going over it. With Peak, you got to scrub it. And I think there's something to be said for that. And I know that's the reason why they're getting these really higher bond strengths with this product. It's a great product. And they're also recommending again scrubbing it in and we're going to do that um, for you know a few seconds here and making sure that we're scrubbing it scrubbing it scrubbing it in um, for about five seconds i'm going to gently gently um, air dry it now when i say air drying it what you want to do is you want to kind of bring your air water out or your air out um, the best part the best thing to use is if you had a you know a, one of those electronic air uh, systems the warm air but most of us don't have that so but have your assistant have the air it looks kind of funny you'll laugh at me but it, the air just if you just arbitrarily come in with some really full first force of air guess where the bonding agent is going to go you know right everywhere but if i come in really slowly give it a chance to almost start to dry on its own then i can thin it out and then light cure it and making sure that you follow manufacturer's instructions for the light cure now listen don't have a cure light it's got three layers of composite on there you know make sure that you got a good cure light 
um, and that it's a clean surface on the light. So this way we make sure that our composites are cured. And this is where we get failures because we're using a cure light that should really be in the Smithsonian and not in the practice. Okay. So I use a Velo. I absolutely love it. It's one of the best uh, cure lights you'll ever buy. Uh, it is absolutely destructible. Ask me how I know, because I've dropped it on the floor. Uh, um, and, uh, and so it's a really great cure light and I feel very good using it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to jump to and let's place the composite. All right. Seeing is believing. Here, what I do, I like to use um, syringes. I'm just a syringe girl because um, I feel like I get more bang for my buck, you know. So I'm going to lay it out on a pad and I like to scoop it up. Notice I'm using a wax spatula here. It really doesn't matter. You can use whatever instrument you want, but this is the cheapest instrument. And it's what I use 90% of the time, anytime I'm doing an anterior restoration. Now I put a little bit too much on. Okay. So what I'm going to use, this is the magic sauce. I'm telling you, this is, if you don't buy anything or use anything, you have to have this, but really important. Wedding resin is amazing. Look how easy this is to do. Almost too good to be true. If I wasn't doing it under a visualizer, you probably wouldn't even believe me because again, I'm not a dentist. I didn't go to lab school. I'm not a CDT, um, but I'll tell you, I, it's so easy when you've got a really a creamy composite that you can utilize um, and also using the wedding resin. The wedding resin is the secret because you can squeeze it out on your glove. I actually go back and forth so I can feel the facial surface of the adjacent teeth. I also am able to really thin it out. Um, and then if I made it too short, you see here, I took just a little bit of pearl snow or you can use a trans. I roll it into a little hot dog and I lay it on the lingual surface and come forward. It's almost like you do the, the alginate impression, you know, you're going to come back and come forward. That's what I did with it. Just layered it underneath, fix that incisal edge ever so slightly, took my resin, went across just one more time. It is the secret. And I mean that it wasn't even a few seconds. And as you're doing this, you'll be like, oh my gosh, are you serious? We're done. Not every single case is going to be like this, but most of the cases will. Now, there's a lot of studies out there that say the more that you touch the composite, the polymerization is going to be stronger. And that's not me. That's Ed McLaren. He's done studies that say, you know, that, and I'm going to read what he says. He says, here's where we really think about starting to come into problems when we just hurry up, we slap it onto the tooth and we just paddle it. And then we're going to take a burr to it to cut it back down. We're going to build it up with all these layers and we're going to cut it back down with the burr. This is where we're, and it makes sense to me. You're getting into your burrs and digging into the beautiful restoration you just placed. And now what we're doing is we're, we're tearing up the bond. We're tearing up the bond strengths that we just put into it. Right? So it makes sense to me. And so one of the things that he likes to do, and he says, this is why I think he's so successful. He doesn't like to touch it with any burr for at least 24 hours. And I thought, that makes a lot of sense because I will tell you that there's a lot of patients that we don't really do this for. And if you can spend time placing this and you see in dentistry, we want to touch everything, right? We want to touch it. We want to feel it. We want to keep playing with it. But he actually says, if you do this for about 10 minutes, you're actually, you're getting a better bond. And I will tell you, don't want to use alcohol or acetone or bonding agent that has acetone in it because if you're dipping your instrument or utilizing alcohol to wipe off your instrument alcohol has water you're putting water into the composite this is why i like to use wedding resin and um and i will tell you i love this one i can't do anything without it um, but again they do go hand in hand you got to have a composite that you can manipulate so I love it. And, and I will tell you that the only reason why I put it on with the paddle was because I wanted to make sure that I got it right in the center of my viewfinder. Okay. A couple of things that I learned from Shoji, my lab technician, is by utilizing this paddle, the last thing you want to do is make this tooth look like a unitooth, right? You got to go back to your golden proportions, following the line angles, following the papilla. It's why I like to use that wax spatula that you saw me using because I can place it right into the inner proximal area, but I also have, it's got, uh, it's long enough to where I can point it right to the papilla and make sure that I made it the right width. Because a lot of times we lose our composure and we kind of overlap it onto the other teeth. And you want to make sure, because the last thing you want is patient to say, well, this tooth is bigger than this tooth. Um, and I've done that. 
I love using artist brushes. This is a number two artist brush. You could get it from any artist store because you sometimes if you buy it in dentistry, no offense, uh, buy it from a dealer, you're gonna pay four times as much, but I'm dipping it in wetting resin, not alcohol, not the bonding agent that we utilize. Again, no acetone, no alcohol, um, just wetting resin. And uh, if you don't have this, you, you, this is the one thing you gotta buy because it will help you so much. But look at that. Didn't have to, I'm using my fingernail for everything, everything. Why? Because I want to feel it. We're tactile people and um, it works. I mean, it's just smooth. I, there have been times where I've never had to polish these restorations at all. And the best restoration is the one that you don't have to polish. So to me, Dr. McLaren hit it right on the head. So when we look at where we were, where we are now and how we got there, again, thinking about replacing it right on top we're patting it down we're taking our wedding resin and we're going to go back and forth back and forth making sure again we don't want this to be too thick because a lot of times if it's too thick it's going to break we don't want it to be you know we want to come up on the tooth a little bit more remember we talked about having the bevel making sure we don't get that line that's the best way to do it is to make sure that you've got a thin surface even if the chip is there come up a little bit higher so you can really make sure that it blends in well utilizing the resin uh, wedding resin on my finger. I like using black gloves because I can see it. That's one of the reasons why I use it. It's not because we want to be flashy. Um, it's great if you're doing surgery, you don't see it. <laughs> it hides the blood. Uh, but the other thing is, is the fact that I can see the color a little bit better. So I like to use the black. And um, these are from Cranberry. It's a great uh, company here in the US. And I'm not sure if you have those there, but I like it. And so then remember, you see here, it's a little bit short. So I took a little bit of the translucent or you can use the Pearl, Pearl Frost, Pearl Snow, they've got a couple of different ones depending on the patient. And watch, I'm just going to apply it to the incisal edge. I come on the lingual, come forward on the facial, smooth it out again. What's funny is I developed about 12 instruments for Hugh Freedy because we haven't changed instruments in a bazillion years, right? We're still using the same surgical instruments we did when they were uh, first starting out doing surgery. Uh, and I can tell you with this, you don't even need it. It's almost sad. Um, so pretty sad you make instruments you don't even use. <laughs> so anyway, but again, you know, it's going to look a little translucent until you start using the wedding resin. What I love about the wedding resin too, is it's not really, um, it's a little bit on the creamy yellow side. So if it starts to look a little bright to you, don't worry about that. Start using a little bit of the wedding resin and it kind of tones it down just a little bit too, but, um, I love it. And, uh, what a great service, you know, for your patient, especially if they can't afford it. You know, the last thing you ever want is for someone to walk away and be so self-conscious of something that they can't replace. And if you can repair it for a, uh, a minimal fee, they walk away and they're your best friend. And the best referral is the one that's in your chair. And that's what we have to think about. And I think, again, going back to, you know, a lot of people would say, I would just cut it off. Why not just redo it? Well, sometimes people can't, and especially in this day and age where, you know, we're all having to be very uh, frugal with the income that we have. Again, I feel at the end of the day, it's the best thing to do. Um, now, listen, if it's broken completely and it really is a repair that is just totally something we can't do or it's going to not look good, then don't do it. You know, but you got to follow your gut. And at the end of the day, I always say I got to sleep at night knowing that it was a good service and thinking about if that were my family, because let's face it, that's what we are in dentistry, right, is to take care of people. Here, easy. The easiest thing to do is replace something like this, where it's just an incisal edge, uh, and uh, and then you know polishing it. Now I can tell you that I really now fall back on what Dr. McLaren said because it, you know, it makes sense to me. If it makes sense to me, it's like I get it, you know. And um, here, you know, when I polish it because it was just such a thin. Now Grant lasted her all these years, right? But now I do wait, you know. And and if I can get away with not having to polish it, I don't polish it at all. So. Um, I'll tell them, listen, let's come come back and see me in two days and let's just check it. Make sure your bite is right. That's how we get away with it. Your bite is right. Make sure everything looks good and feels good to you. I want to polish it a little bit more, but I want you to look at it. A couple of things that I want to make sure, too, that you understand is if you have a patient who has square teeth, don't make them round because you like round. OK, if they're coming in, their teeth are square. You got to make them square. OK. I love square. And that's just me. And if you're in my chair and you're my patient, you're going to get square until you tell me you want to round them. But listen, we know that you can round square, right? But you can't square around. So go ahead and make them square. 
and you can always sit them up and round it. And that's one of the things that's hard to do when they're sitting in your chair at 12 o'clock is to try to round edges. I always sit them up eye to eye and then make some modifications because you could really make it too short or cut it off and then you got to go back and bond it. And the last thing that you want to do is have to go back and you know start over um, after it's cured. That's when it becomes really tough. OK, so having those restorations look really, really good. I can tell you that I felt like the restoration that I did looked better than the veneer, but don't tell my doctor that. Right. Um, and uh, she's very happy thinking about our golden proportions, thinking about what it is that you're looking at, keeping your composure. Don't go over to the next tooth. And I like using that wax spatula. Hugh Freedy has some gorgeous instruments um, out there, um, but I like the, I still, I'm getting, you know, I, I like the paddle um, and uh, it just kind of helps me to, uh, to know exactly where I'm going. And um, I like it. The other thing is, is as the teeth go back, we know the embrasure spaces get deeper, right? So again, thinking about that, one of the things that you can utilize that I love is, you know, just given having three options, you know, thinking about the central being square, square round or round. And, um, and again, if it's round, great, but if it's not start off with square, cause you can always, you know, round that, um, and make adjustments. A lot of times too, I don't make that many adjustments that day, because remember what we said, we don't want to arbitrarily take a bird to it, but I would much rather wait because sometimes when we're tired, especially at the end of the day, and we start messing with something, um, we might have some issues. I've learned that firsthand, right? Say, you know, I'm going to get you back in two days. I want you to look at it. Let me know if we need to make some little tweaks to it. We'll be more than happy to do that. It looks great today. Let's see you back. If this is Tuesday, let's see you back on Thursday just for a check and we can do a little tweak then. Um, those are the things that I think are really good. Now, before we wrap up, I want to share with you something that I shouldn't have done. This is something that I should not have done. This is a patient that broke a bridge and, um, I really and truly didn't know enough about chemicals when I first started doing this, which was wrong. I should have knew more about hydrofluoric acid. Um, and this is where now I've made it my mission to make sure that team members understand science, but they also understand the chemicals that we're utilizing in our hands. And so here I really did not think about the patient's tissue. Now I got lucky on it, right? Um, but here I am, I'm using a hydrofluoric on Denton, on to structure. Should not have done that. I should have used the hydrofluoric and I should have used the phosphoric on the tooth. Um, thank goodness the patient didn't have any sensitivity. Um, thank goodness it looked good. Thank goodness I didn't have tissue irritation. I should have placed a gingival light cured barrier, then used two different, you know, etchants and I didn't. And again, I can't go back. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, it's something to, again, you got to pay attention to, um, I was surprised that it lasted her two years because it did. Um, and yes, it didn't had to be replaced. Um, I thought it looked really good, but again, made some mistakes, making sure you protect that tissue. This is going to be on there for 90 seconds. That's a long time. Um, and then utilizing again, anytime it's natural tooth structure, we're using phosphoric, not hydrofluoric like I did here. And I feel like it's something that I had to bring up and show you, you know, bonding is such a good service. And again, when you think about all the things that I've been through and think about my own dentition and how many times my teeth have been prepared in dentistry, we always want to think about doing the least amount of dentistry that we can to give the patient what they're looking for. And that's always been what I've lived by, especially now being a patient. And I've had patients come in that, you know, that have beautiful teeth and they want to veneer them. And, um, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we could just bleach your teeth and maybe do some bonding because again, once it's gone, you can't get it back. And I work for a dentist that has the same beliefs. So it's, it's so great, you know, and as an assistant working with a doctor, we're your partner, we're not your competitor, we're your partner. And we need to know as much as you do. And I am so blessed again, going back to Ross Nash, John Cranham, Ed McLaren, Michael Miller, and more. Um, I'm so blessed to really know that and, um, and being able to pass those on uh, to you. And, uh, and I just appreciate so much that I was able to really give this course being asked to do this today. You can tell I'm very passionate about it. Most importantly, utilizing products that I love. Um, these products from Ultradent, they're very easy. They are tried and true. I have not changed them, uh, I guess, because they're, uh, I've had such great success. And if anybody tells you that it's not going to last and that's not the right procedure, um, I will stand up against them any day. And I have, because I know that it works. And again, 
having the conversation about the post-operative instructions. If you don't tell patients, don't bite into a bagel, you can't use your teeth as tools. It will last hopefully a year, two years until we can buy a little bit more time because I want to try to see if we can get some longevity out of this first. If the patient comes back and it broke, we said, you know, we tried. And that's a good thing to say, hey, listen, we tried. Now we know we're going to have to replace it, right? And you can shake your head and the patient will know. But I'll tell you, when you do something like this, they walk out. That's a good dentist. That's an ethical person. And he's really trying to do the best thing for me. Salvage the tooth structure. Well, thank you again. I want to thank UltraDent for allowing me to showcase their products. I want to thank um, Abaclar Viva Dent for making really strong porcelain now that is hard to sometimes layer. Uh, but again, thanking the Australian Dental Society for allowing me to, our Dental Association for allowing me to deliver this message. And thank you for your time and hope to see you again at another one of our courses. So good day. Mm -hmm.